one of us have a, a choice as believers. We can choose to be a godly Christian, or we can choose to be a godless Christian. And behind me, I have a, a chart. It may look a little bit overwhelming. And, you know, sometimes life is that way. Sometimes it's overwhelming. We have so many choices. What's important in all of these choices that we put God in the center? That's what it means to be godly. It means what is in our center. And there are so many things that try to get into the center of our hearts and our lives. And uh, God wants to be in the center. So, today... The topic is, are we a godly Christian or are we a godless Christian? There are so many things that push into our lives to try to take over the center. The, the world pushes into our lives. Different philosophies push into our lives. We have choices to make every day. You know, Jesus said that he sent us out as sheep among wolves. Now, I don't know about you, but as a sheep, Walking among wolves, I know that I am in danger. And we have this choice of either giving into the danger and maybe protecting ourselves or just walking just straight ahead and knowing that Christ will protect us even though it may cause us some difficulty. We want to look here today at what it means to be godly, what it means to be obedient, or what it means to be godless and put something else in the center. And we have so many choices to make. We're going to look at our different responsibilities in the sacred area, the social area, the civic area, and the market area. The sacred area is how we live our lives in front of God. And we're going to look at how we live with our people we're connected to, our connected community, our kingdom community, and our natural community. So let's Let's start right off with our challenge. We have a challenge right here in living for God among our, those people that we are connected to. Now, our, ch our challenge with people that we are connected to, be it our spouse or our children or whoever we might uh, feel comfortable with, our friends, people at work, our co coworkers, we have a challenge, and I would say that challenge is that we have nested responsibilities and we are always challenged to be unbalanced in those. Now, I have um, a friend who, for a good many years, would not be really um, available to work cooperatively to serve the Lord. Why? Because what was the center of her life was her children. Every decision she made, even when the children were 12, 13, 14, and on up, Every decision she made was based on what her children needed from her. So her children were in the center of her life. And this is, now, she was a good Christian woman. She was trying to do a good Christian thing in taking care of her children. But what happened was, in this nested responsibility here of taking care of what God needed, taking care of what her family needed, and what her children needed, she actually got into imbalance. So in some ways, she was living a godless life. Why? Because God was not the center. And we all have this challenge that comes to us in our choices, our small choices that make one choice makes a habit, a habit makes a lifestyle, and a lifestyle makes a lifetime. So in every choice, we need to make sure that God is in the center. So for here, our connected community, we're going to talk about thinking about our center and making sure that God is part of the center. Now, let's move over to the kingdom community and our choice for godliness or godlessness in the kingdom. Um, do you know that there is, um, when a salesperson comes in and to sell you something, uh, one of the things that we always ask ourselves, is that salesperson telling me the truth? Now, why do we ask that? Because if they don't tell us the truth, we might make a decision to buy their product even though their product is not what we need. Why? Because they didn't tell us the truth. Well, there's this principle 
that just seems to operate in the world that if we don't tell the truth it is easier to grow now when we talk about the kingdom it is easy to grow our churches or our ministries easier to grow them if we don't tell people the truth and uh, this happens all the time I had um, a good friend who was a pastor probably like your pastor or if you're like if you are a pastor maybe like you and he was uh, preaching the good news of the kingdom he was sharing the truth of the word the only thing is in his congregation there were people who didn't see it that way they did not see the Bible as the Word of God they saw it as a collection of maybe nice stories that we should pay attention to from time to time and they certainly didn't see our lives centered around this choice of whether we're going to serve God or serve ourselves they did, there were some people in um, his congregation that didn't see it that way but you know what my friend this pastor he just kept talking about talking about the scripture talking about salvation pretty soon the folks at his church came together and they had a board meeting and at that board meeting they decided that he was unfit to be their pastor because he was telling the truth now he could have made a compromise kind of backed off that a little bit so he didn't irritate people and guess what he might have even been able to grow his church he certainly would have been able to keep his job but as it is he told the truth and he was he was removed so our challenge here in the kingdom is growth are we going to compromise on the truth so we can maybe personally benefit or so that we can grow our ministry um, that is a choice that everybody needs to make and that's a choice for you folks too if you're going to a congregation that vacillates on the core uh, truths of the scripture on uh, the Word of God if they say it is not the Word of God if they vacillate on salvation they say well Jesus is a good man in one of the great ways of salvation folks I would challenge you you have a choice to live either godly and say uh, no this is not for me or you can stay and participate in that because that is godlessness you have a choice to make and I would encourage you to make a godly choice okay now in the natural we have this um, responsibility our sacred responsibility in the natural is to go make disciples of all nations so making disciplined followers making disciples is our responsibility now I spend a lot of time on Twitter I have been on Twitter a few years have a uh, 19,000 followers and um, what I have found from being on Twitter is when you talk about godly things on Twitter guess what people don't like that they don't want us to make disciples oh now they don't mind if we make disciples of each other that is not a problem but we are uh, when we're out in the open out in the market so to speak and we talk about godliness versus godliness there is a whole group of people that don't like that they try to shut our mouths shut us down and that will bring us to we're gonna skip right down here to the civic and the social that will bring us to the key thing I think that governs our society and what we say and what we do it prevents us from making disciples here and that key concept is um, political correctness we have a choice political correctness comes about because there is what there is a conflict there is a conflict between what God wants us to do what is godly and what is right and what is godless and what is wrong and in this conflict there is a resolution here and it's called political correctness if you are politically co correct you can believe whatever you want but you learn to talk in a way that doesn't ruffle anyone's feathers now Jesus wasn't that way he actually just said the truth and let the chips fall where they may now true we have this ministry of reconciliation that we are here to reconcile people to God 
and to reconcile people to each other. That is one of our core ministries, to always be lifting Christ up. That is how we recon reconcile. We reconcile people to God by lifting Christ up. Well, guess what? That doesn't go in our our culture. People don't like that. In, as a matter of fact, they pretty much they hate it. And I can tell you from being a tweet preacher, I am a tweet preacher on Twitter. In other words, I talk about uh, social issues. I talk about uh, civic issues. And I talk about godliness. I can tell you right now, people don't like that. So political correctness is a form of godlessness and we can either participate in that system or we can say, nope, not for me. I'm going to stand up for Christ no matter what the cost. And that is the godly choice. So in the social area, we have the choice of telling the truth. Now, let me talk about one of our big social issues. I would call this um, um, probably one of the biggest things that we face in America today. We have a crime against humanity that's being committed every single day, and that is the killing of unborn children. If you uh, are on Twitter and you talk about how bad this is, you will quickly find other people who disagree with you. And um, they have all different kinds of uh, reasons to disagree with you, uh, everything from maybe women's rights uh, it's uh, my body, I can make a choice, which I do agree we should be able to make choices on my body. But if you have an unborn child in your body, that child has rights too. And you ought not to be making choices for that child, particularly to end its life. So I'd say the, the rubber meets the road, you get to the end of the road when you start talking about rights, when you say that one person has the right to take the life of another. I would like to tell you uh, just a little bit about this girl, Josie. Um, now, Josie, she is a, a teenager, um, about 17, and uh, she is just a wonderful Christian girl. She leads worship, and like most uh, uh, people at that age, she's planning her college career. Um, her goal is cinematography. Um, the interesting thing about Josie is she had a different kind of start in life than maybe most of you watching, certainly different than me. Josie was conceived through incest. And um, this, as far as abortion, tends to be the key issue. They really think that people like Josie should be able to be killed if they're very, very young. Now, Josie has grown up to be a beautiful Christian girl. Let me tell you her start. Her mom uh, was a victim of incest. And I, our heart goes out to people who are victimized by this. And um, unfortunately, what happens is abortion often covers up this crime. Um, her mother, Anna, was uh, victimized by her stepfather. And uh, this went on for a long time. Her stepfather was a very good liar and had uh, this little girl, Anna, totally uh, cowed and frightened that if she told anyone, terrible things would happen. Well, at 12 years old, Anna got pregnant. The, uh, she told her stepfather she was pregnant, and guess what he did? He aborted the baby. He arranged for the baby to be aborted. Because that happened, he was able to continue to abuse not only Anna, but Anna and her sister for a whole nother year. Anna became pregnant again. This time, she didn't tell her stepfather that she was pregnant. She was about two months along, 13 years old, two months pregnant, and her mom noticed changes in her body and said, Anna, are you pregnant? And Anna went ahead and said, yes, dad has been doing things to me. Well, mother immediately moved because she had no idea this was going on. She immediately moved the girls to the aunt's house. They did testing and found for sure that the um, uh, stepfather was the father. 
And he went to jail. He went to jail for 10 years. If that baby had simply been aborted, he may not have gone to jail. The evidence would have been destroyed. But you know what? Anna was a very unusual 13-year-old girl. Even at 13 year old years of age, she knew that what was growing in her womb was a human life. And she said the biggest regret she has from those years is the other baby that was aborted. She says, I know I have a baby waiting for me in heaven. And I wonder what that baby would have grown up to be because she can see what happened in the life of Josie. Now, this is one of the key things that people throw up in our faces to say, well, what about abortion for rape and incest? Well, here is abortion for rape and incest that occurred once, but that led to a whole nother year of incest and rape. And that second time, they didn't... There wasn't one crime committed after another. You know, when a rape occurs, that's one crime. But when we turn around and add murder to that, it doesn't solve the first crime. It just makes it worse. I would like to challenge you that in our connected community on the social level, I believe there are Christian parents who have participated in this crime this godless crime against God and against humanity in helping uh, maybe their children or maybe their nieces, nephews, or friends' children get abortions. Folks, this is being a godless Christian. We ought not to participate in godlessness at any level, especially when it comes to murder. This is a hot topic. And people, um, they, they seem to think that it is a... Uh, maybe a political, a civic, a political topic. Yes, we've been cowed into believing that the, not saying anything about this is politically correct. But I would submit to you that there is a why in the road. We can either be politically correct and godless, or we can be politically incorrect and godly. Okay, so now let's go in the social area, maybe as far as the kingdom goes. I know that there are many uh, uh, local congregations, local churches, who stand up against godlessness. They stand up against abortion. And one of the other key topics that are, is on the horizon is gay marriage. Now, I would like to be the first to say that as individuals, God himself gives us a choice on how we live. We can live godly or we can live any life we choose. And people do have the right to choose alternate lifestyles, God allows them to do that. And we ought not to think that we can get in the place of God and start managing people's personal lives. But when it comes to legalizing gay marriage, we need to be very, very circumspect as believers and understand where this will lead. Canada has gone before us in this regard. They have legalized gay marriage. And what is the outcome in Canada? It is the taking away of freedom from Christians in that it is illegal in many circumstances for Christians to stand up and say gay, gay marriage is wrong. You can actually go to jail in some circumstances for standing up and saying gay marriage is wrong. Why? Because it is a right given to people to be recognized as a gay couple as a gay marriage, and so that ripples down to taking away the right to speak against that type of lifestyle, to say that God is not pleased with a man and a man or a woman and a woman. So we have this case here where we have a choice in the kingdom in this social issue regarding gay marriage, and too many churches are compromising for the purpose of political correctness. They are, in fact, choosing a godless center. The godless center is, we already covered it. They don't want to reduce their growth. They don't want people to think bad. They're actually like salespeople selling snake oil, saying that something is something it's not. 
the truth of the gospel is this, that God wants us to live holy lives. He wants us to live lives dedicated to him in all areas, including sexuality, including our choices, and including uh, making choices that disciple the nation. This is one of the purposes that we're here, is to disciple the nation. We have a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. When we do not voice our uh, godly positions when it comes to making laws and ordinances, when we just allow things to be uh, put into law that are ungodly, we are not being godly citizens. And now we're going to jump down here to the ci civic is we compromise. We compromise and allow ungodly choices when we don't put our voice to laws and ordinances that are uh, uh, supporting laws that are godless. Okay, so let's refocus here for a second. I have a friend. I want to talk a little bit here about the civic um, in our com uh, connected community. I have a friend who was telling me one time they were having a discussion with a number of their girlfriends, and somebody brought up the topic that we just talked about, gay marriage. And she said, you know what? I didn't know what to say. I knew that they were for legalizing gay marriage, and I didn't know what to say. Now, why is it that she didn't know what to say? She didn't know what to say because we live in a culture that tells us what to say. The, our culture tells us at all times that we should say, well, everybody has a right to make their own choices, and I shouldn't impose my choice on somebody else. So I suggested to her, maybe it would have been a good idea if you had said, well, although I wouldn't take away from somebody their right to make a choice, I would like to say that I don't think that that choice goes along with what God wants people to choose. That was just a simple thing. And she sat back and she said to me, you know, you're right. I could have said that. And uh, it just hadn't occurred to her that there was a, uh, uh, a way to say it that would have been holding up a standard of godliness right there with her friend. So I know that many of us get into this trap all the time. We're in conversations where uh, we can make a statement for godliness or we can listen to what's been poked in our ear and make a statement for political correctness. I just want to encourage every one of you to be obedient, to make a choice not to be a godless Christian, but to be a godly Christian, just say the truth. You might say, well, if I say the truth, then maybe won't, people won't like me. Well, it's not that they won't like you. If you tell them the truth, maybe they won't like God. And that's not a terrible thing. God himself said, I would rather you be hot or cold than lukewarm. Why? Because if you're hot or cold, if you're cold, you start feeling cold, and then you want to get warmed up. But if you're lukewarm, you can just be kind of stuck in this never, never land and not really realize that you need something different. So uh, being hot or cold is a good thing. If you say something to somebody and they're like, well, I, I can't even believe you said that, you might say, oh, no, I went over the top. No, that's a good thing. It's a good thing. You know, let, let it go. Let it go the way God designed it to, to, to go. He would like people to make a choice to be hot or cold. This lukewarmness, folks, it is killing us. Okay, so let's refocus here. I'd like to talk just a little bit about being godly in the marketplace. And I had this uh, occasion a few years ago. This may have happened to some of you. Maybe some of you have said this. Uh, my husband and I run a business, and we were talking to somebody who was uh, a, a pastor of a local church. And uh, we were comparing some of the principles that we used in our organization. He had an organization, we have an organization. And he said something that stopped me short, something I, I was kind of surprised in a way, but then I he have heard it since many times. And he said, well, 
you run an organization, I am in charge of an organism. And I was like, wait a second, <laughs> wait a second. This is not right. This is so not right. And if he if he would really walk that out a little bit, what he would be saying to me, and then if he said this in his pulpit to all of the other business leaders, all of the other managers, is that God's principles somehow don't apply to you in running your business. In other words, by defining the essence of ministry as one thing and business as another thing, to say that they are of a different essence, that's going down this line of thinking, saying that over here on one side we have business principles and over here on this side we have godly principles and they are in conflict. By thinking in that kind of a term, what we do is we set up things so that businesses run in a godless way. And guess what, folks? That's exactly what's happened. Um, I hate to say it, sometimes when we find the enemy, the enemy is us. We ought not to be thinking this way. We ought to be realize, realizing that running a business, a Christian business, or being a worker in, a, in a, a business, it might even be a secular business, here is the simple uh, principle that Jesus gave for us. He said, whatever we do, do for his glory. And I don't know how many of you have uh, read the book, um, The Practice of the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence. I know this book has been uh, a blessing to me for many years. And when you get down to it, the real uh, heart of gold in this book is Brother Lawrence tells about how he washed dishes for God's glory. And um, so there he is. He's washing dishes. He is a monk in a monastery. This is like in the 1600s. And we are still reading today how this monk in this monastery washed dishes for God's glory. Now, you may, in the market, as uh, uh, you, you're connected to, uh, maybe you're connected to a business, maybe you work in a business. That's your, your role. That's your um, marketplace responsibility. You earn a paycheck and bring it home. So you're connected there. I would submit to you that you are either there as a godly person doing your work with God in the center, or you're there as a godless person maybe figuring out how to um, uh, do the least you can for the most amount of pay. Now, that'd be, that'd be a godless way of looking at it. And unfortunately, having run a business with many Christians, working for us over many years, I can tell you that there are some Christians who are there doing their work as unto the Lord, and there are other Christians who are there to earn a paycheck and to do the least amount for the most amount of work. I mean, it's a fact of life, and I hope that that might not be a fact of life for any of you. But we have this choice. We can be a godly Christian or we can be a godless Christian, and guess what? The people around us know. They know what's in our center. If we say out of our mouth, I'm a Christian, somebody looks over the wall and they see us not being responsible and diligent in our work, bing, it registers in their mind, so that's what it means to live Christ. I don't want any part of it. People who do their work, they are seen as um, a standard. They are seen as somebody that should be, you know, we should look up to. People who do their work well, do their work well for God. And people who don't do their well, work well, they're, look, they're not looked up to. We need to be godly. We need to be godly at work in our Christian community. We have that choice to be godly. Now let's talk about um, the market and the kingdom. Well, I just told you this story. Pastors I and church leaders and ministry leaders, I would encourage you to take down this imaginary wall between the sacred and the market. It doesn't exist. Yes, there may be different objectives in our sacred responsibility, our objective is to bring people into the kingdom, 
in the market our objective is to serve our customers but you know serving our customers is one of our responsibilities in um, in the kingdom is to serve others so it lines up it's just that at the end of the day if a business is not profitable if they do not serve their customers in a profitable way guess what you don't have a business it, you have to be profitable and you have to serve your customers so yes at that level there's a difference but how we do it there are so many places where the responsibilities are nested when we convey that they are conflicted we reduce the market and we actually create this imbalance we create this teeter-totter we give people the idea that somehow they're being more spiritual if they choose an occupation say as a pastor than if they choose an occupation say as a business leader this this is not this is not what god called us to do you know abraham he was a businessman and um so choosing one over the other is not the kind of choice that ministry leaders should be making so in the kingdom and the market what we want to strive for is balance here we want to balance the equation and we want not to actually when we um, uh, communicate an unbalanced equation we don't even realize it and we might be doing it for the best possible motives but we are embedding godlessness into our system and so what we end up is people think well business is of a different essence and they don't bring god in they don't bring god's principles in and we end up with godless christian businesses it ought not to be that way it ought not to be that way we ought to balance it we ought to help people understand that being godly is being godly in every single choice that we make now um on the natural side i'd like to say this about we all have resources uh, i know that um, every one of us makes a decision on where we're going to shop uh where we're going to spend our money and um uh, where we're going to spend our time but I, i'd like to talk right now about where we're going to spend our money um do you know what the richest people group is in the united states and uh, when i ask that question you s might say well what's a people group well like the cherokee indians they're a people group uh the jews are a people group um in the united states what do you think is the richest people group in the united states somebody said chinese i like to tell you it is uh reported to be the amish and why is that well they say the amish when they say go to buy a farm they just bring out often a wad of uh, uh bills and they just count out the money in cash and that's how they buy their farms um the amish trade among themselves 10 times before they go out and trade with uh non-amish who they call the english and then uh reportedly the second richest people group are the jews and they trade among themselves seven times they support each other's businesses seven times before they go out and trade with non-jews what that does is that concentrates the uh the money within their local community they're blessing their jewish brothers their jewish uncles their jewish friends i would submit to you as christians we don't even give a second thought to that we just when we want something we're out there finding the cheapest place that we can get it because it's all about numero uno how can i get the most for the least and we don't even think about what we're doing to our overall community and how we are supporting or not supporting our christian brothers and sisters and um folks this is living in a godless way and it's not that we are this is a sin you know there are two types of sins that we can we can be involved in two types of wrong doings sometimes we do wrong things because we are uh, intentionally committing a an act of disobedience that would be a sin of commission there are other times that we do wrong things and that is because we are omitting a good thing that we should do i would 
submit to you, and it actually comes back to uh, the kingdom that our ministry leaders, our church leaders, ought to be talking about the marketplace and our responsibility in the marketplace to support one another so that we are not accidentally living a godless life in the marketplace and that we just spend our money without ever th any thought of who we are blessing and who we are removing that blessing from and blessing somebody else. That we should be thinking that every time I spend money, I have an opportunity to be a blessing. Now, you know what? That is a, a huge opportunity. And I can tell you there are a lot of times I don't think about it. It's not top of my mind because it's not our culture. But we need to start working so that we live uh, a godly culture among ourselves and we think about these things. And just talking about them stirs up our thinking and we need to talk and keep talking so these things that we omit from our lives that we ought not to we put we put in our lives okay so let let us refocus on what we are talking about here um we're really talking about a choice we're talking about a choice that we make every day to live with god in the center or something else in the center and we have all of these different um, uh, opportunities to make these choices we have responsibilities that we need to keep in balance we have responsibilities that um, push us to conflict that we can actually gain if we go down that line and we might feel that we will lose if we go down this line you know Jesus said that if we serve him he will uh, fulfill the desires of our heart and some people have taken that to say well you want a new car serve Christ and you get a new car uh, not so much when we serve him what does he do to our hearts he changes our desires and brings them into alignment with his desires so when we serve him our desires become his desires and then he fulfills the desires of our heart because they are his desires. That's what it means to prosper in the kingdom. That's what it means to prosper in our own personal lives. That's what it means to live God, godly lives with God in the center. So, moving right along. I've talked so fast. I'm running out of material. I have to check and see if I've missed some stories that I was going to tell you. I want to talk to you, kind of in wrapping this up, about the thing that I think is closest to my heart. And um, this is our need for assembly. And we have this choice I would say this is a moment-by-moment moment choice. On a moment-by-moment moment basis, we all have things to do. I don't know about you, but I, I'm sure you're busy. I am busy, too. And on a moment-by-moment moment basis, I have this choice on what I'm going to do. And this is the nature of human beings. It's my nature. It's your nature. It's all of our, our nature. We want to make choices that uh, uh, please us. And so... It is nice to be able to check off a box and say, we have done our job here so we can go over and do something else. When it comes to extending the kingdom, it is way too easy to put extending the kingdom in a box. Let's see. Okay, I went to um, church on Sunday, and guess what? I'm a Sunday school teacher, so check off the box. I've done my job there, but you know what? That can tend us to live godless life, lives. And let me tell you how that works out. If we checked off the box because we did it at church, maybe we did it at Sunday school. Maybe I'm a, the Sunday school teacher and I spent three or four hours preparing for that lesson. But I checked off that box. Then I can walk out of that service and feel like, well, I'm done for the week. Now I can get on with, you know, doing all the other important things I have in my life and leave God behind, and leave God out of my life. That is living a godless life, and I might be a Sunday school teacher. 
Here is living a godly life. It is looking at all of my communities, my family. Am I working to bring God into the center of my family, into the center of my marriage, into the center with my children? Am I talking to my children about the things that God is doing in the world, what he's done in the past, what he is uh, planning to do in the future, what he is doing in my life, what he's doing in their lives, what he... They can look forward to him doing in their lives in the future. Am I talking to my children about that? Am I reaching out to my extended family? You know, a lot of people have brothers and sisters who are Christians, but they don't live their lives with Christ in the center. Why? Because we checked off that box when we left the service. We need to bring Christ into the center. We need to assemble in, uh, you know, when was the last time when you had a family gathering uh, maybe Thanksgiving, maybe just Sunday dinner, and you took a moment to celebrate the Lord's Supper there with your brothers, there with your sisters and their families. You know, we don't do these kind of things. Why? Because we're not living God in the center, and too often we're not challenging people to live God in the center, with God in the center. And that's what I'm here for today, folks. I'm here to say that if we're going to live godly lives as Christians, we have to be thinking about this. When we're at work at the marketplace, we're sitting beside um, believers. Do we sit together and say, hey, how can we live and, and work together so that we can make disciples, uh, disciples of people around us? Or do we have that box checked off and assume that they do too, and that's going to happen in their church? It happens in my, my church on Sunday morning. We don't need to worry about it on uh in the marketplace we might sit there at lunch and talk about um baseball or sewing you know whatever you know day after day and we're not thinking hey we have lunch time that we could be spending assembling together and making disciples of each other this is living godly godly christian lives or if we leave god behind it's living a godless christian life folks that we're in a serious, serious time, a, a serious time in our lives, serious time in our nation. We're not going to solve the problems that we see around us unless we live God every day, every moment of every day with the Christians around us in all of our communities, in our families, in our extended families, at work, in our neighborhood. I would just encourage you to sit down, think about your life, you know, take stock. We all need to do this. Take stock. Make godly choices. Put God in the center. It is all about him. It is about serving him. And if there are times that you have made choices that were less than godly, maybe you had an abortion. Maybe you encouraged someone to have an abortion. Maybe you gave your blessing on an ungodly union. You know what? God is the God of redemption. He is the God who will forgive you. He is the God who will bring peace to your hearts. So we're not ever at a point of condemnation. We're not ever at a point of lack of hope. But we're always at a point where we can come to him and say, I want today to be different, and I want my life to count for you. I want to live for you in every way, every day. That's what it means to be a godly Christian. God bless you as you make that choice.